our lives back together again individually and collectively as a church family is that we ask and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into this new normal, this new normal. Now, last week, I kind of addressed the question of why now this series of messages about change, uh, which is about a new normal of sorts, like, like, why do we need to allow the Spirit to change and transform us now, okay? I mean, why now in a season where everything we already know has been kind of attacked by change, or so it seems, why now? Well, because there are just times when people, even God's people, are more apt to listen than others, right? For instance... There are two occasions that I can think of besides a worship service setting like this that a preacher shares the word of God uh, where he preaches God's word. And one is at a wedding and the other one is, anyone care to guess? A funeral, yeah. Okay, so we got that. So let me ask you this. At which one do you think people are more likely to listen? A funeral, yeah. Now, I I don't mean to insult anyone about weddings, but what a preacher tries more than anything do at a wedding is get through it and not mess up and be noticed okay that's the big goal okay because truth be told at a wedding people are more focused on the decor the dresses the romance how the couple look together i mean not even the couple are really listening all that much to what the message is okay i mean they're, they're looking at each other and they're dreaming their future but people i mean people listen i get that but then in a few minutes like right after it's over they just like, fall back right into default mode and life goes on right Default mode, nothing really changes. But at a funeral, yeah, and I don't want to be insensitive to anyone on this one either, but there is something about the person of focus at a funeral that just kind of tends to bring out a more serious nature in the audience, right? I mean, mean, when life gets, you know, kind of dead serious, people tend to pay a lot of attention to the Word of God. Okay, and so what I think is probably true of most pastors or preachers is, I mean, when the attention to the word of God is the focal point, that most preachers or pastors would rather preach a funeral than a wedding. They would, okay? And I know from where you sit, that's probably like, well, it's kind of weird even thinking about that, but bottom line, I mean, a wedding is like a party or a celebration, and a funeral is like a funeral, okay? And at a funeral, people tend to listen to the word of God a lot more closely. And listen, friends, this is the point. What, what, what that means for individuals there listening is there's a growth opportunity there. There's a growth opportunity there because growth can take place when you grieve. I mean, it's like an opportunity that's unique, I think. Okay, it's uniquely so, I think, uh, because whenever suffering and grief kind of walk in the room, it always leaves the door open to growth. So the title of this message specifically this morning as we attempt to wrap up the series of messages, No Blind Default Modes. Because before all of this, like 11 months ago, 12 months ago, you had some kind of a routine. I don't know if you remember anymore what it was, okay? And the truth is, you might not even have known that you had a routine. Maybe at the time, you wouldn't even have been able to recognize that you had a routine, but you did. Like, we all have routines, okay? Uh, It's our predictable way of doing things. It's predictable pattern of life, okay? Now, some of you, I personality types, are like, no, I'm not that way. I'm not that way. I'm more spontaneous. I like to kind of fly by the seat of my pants. And I don't don't really have a routine because I'm unpredictable, okay? And you're probably thinking that from that same spot that you sit every week, right? All right, you're sitting in that same spot you sat last week thinking that, but that's not really what makes you, un, you know, makes you predictable. You know, that's not, I mean, what kind of makes you predictable about you is that you're unpredictable. So yeah, we all have routines. We just like, like to be clear though, there's nothing wrong with having a routine uh, unless of course the routine is wrong, okay? So, or to say it another way, it's not completely correct, okay? But to be clear, there's nothing wrong with having a routine. In fact, those with personality types like mine, you probably like a routine. A routine can bring comfort and security. And so a routine can be good, but for a lot of us, what happens, our routines actually, at the end, up being more like a rut, okay? And we get stuck in it, and we didn't even know we had it, okay? And so my prayer would be in this message that we wouldn't just go back to that old routine, that we wouldn't blindly default and just go back to doing the things that we've always done, that we wouldn't just go back to blind default living where you just go back and you're doing what you did and you're being who you were, right? But having said that, I would also like to say that for the vast majority of us, my expectation is, is that's exactly what will happen, Okay, that's exactly what will happen. I mean, the reason I say that is 
you know, well, you can Google the psychology on this, and that's what you're going to find, okay? That, that if you do, I mean, if you Google it, you'll find that a blind default mode is pretty much the norm. You just go back to what you know, okay? Or, or, or rather than look it up on Google, we could do this. How many of you uh, were here back at New Lisbon Christian Church back years ago when we asked everyone for one week to sit in a different seat than they did normally on Sunday? You remember that? It was back when we intentionally went to two services. Okay, how many, how many, you remember that? Raise your hand so I know. Like most everybody, okay, okay, so, so you know, and, and, and you know, I, we were a little scared about it. I actually prayed that nobody would go tilt, you know, when we asked them to do that, okay, uh, but, but I remember it too. I, I mean, I remember, I sat right over there, uh, right about in the row in front of where Ed is, because Don Froderman used to sit there, but what we did is we asked everybody, you know, if you sat in the back, sit in the front, if you sat on the right side, sit on the left side, just move somewhere, okay, and, and I sat right over there where Don used to sit. Anyway, it went pretty good. Everybody played along, had fun with it for one week, but the next week, yeah, you're laughing because you know, where, where did everyone sit the next week? Right back in their normal seat, yeah. Now, the only ones who maybe didn't do that are those people who realized that by doing that, by going back to normal, that would make them normal so they didn't do it. Okay, but then again, since they're, the thing predictable about them is they're unpredictable, it was predictable. It was normal for them, right? Okay, and so, but listen, the point is, the, good, the, the point of this whole series, in fact, is, is that if only, it's only by recognizing and realizing that our default mode is blind, for it will lead us right back to the way things have always been. We need to recognize that, okay? And it's recognizing this truth about our natural selves, okay? That we can then enlist the Holy Spirit's guidance to a new normal, okay? And then and only then do we stand any chance of doing anything different by recognizing it and enlisting the Holy Spirit to change us, okay? And so that's my hope, that's my prayer, that coming out of this season of pandemic, that now will be the time for all of us to have the courage to be intentional, to pay attention, and to think about who we were and what we were doing and how we want things to be different going forward, okay? So we good so far. Does that make sense? Speak to me, yes? Okay, all right. So if you have your Bibles or your, your Bible apps and you haven't done it already, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, book in the Old Testament, where we're going to revisit a couple of godly men who we looked at not too long ago, but this time we're going to kind of look at them again and read from a, I'm looking for a new normal perspective. Okay, that's how, how we're coming at this. As we look at a moment in the life of a prophet named Elijah and his mentor Elijah, okay, and we're probably going to, we're, well, we're not probably, we're going to place the most emphasis or focus on Elijah, okay? So 1 Kings 19 is where we read about him. I mean, it's where we kind of get introduced to him as a Bible reader, and it's at this point of history that Elijah, who, who you might be more familiar with, who, because he's the mentor, all right? He's the first, and then Elijah's the second, okay? They come right there together, Elijah, Elijah, okay? And by the time we get to 1 Kings 19, Elijah, the first, he's struggling. I mean, he is a hero of the faith, no doubt, okay? But if you know his life story, you know that he gets to this point in his life where he's tired, and he's struggling, and his time, he feels, is about over, okay? And if you don't know, you should read it sometime. It's a really great story. But in the first half of this chapter, chapter 19 of 1 Kings, Elijah is just emotionally spent and overwhelmed. I mean, he's lonely, he's depressed, he's feeling completely spent. And I feel like, you know, in wintertime, after 12 months of what we've been doing, a lot of people are kind of in this state right now, okay? And so in verse 16, God responds to what's going, what, what Elijah's going through by telling him about a man named Elijah that's going to succeed him, and he's going to follow Elijah as Israel's prophet. So that's kind of pick up, the, we're going to pick up the story. Now, note takers, you're going to write this down first. For when we meet Elijah, Elijah, he's living in a way that I would say is a very routine or normal life, okay? Very routine or normal life. Now, what, what I like about this, I mean, Elijah as an example, is, is that his routine or his old normal, it wasn't bad, okay? It wasn't like a bad routine, okay? And the reason I like this is that so many highlighted stories in the Christian faith are always like Cinderella stories, you know, like rags to riches stories where you have this down and out lowly person, you know, that has made all the wrong decisions in life, like the Samaritan woman that we mentioned last week. And then Jesus comes along and life suddenly gets good and joyful. And so, I mean, those are great stories, but, but, but you know, for those kind of people, that's not a big surprise. I mean, those on the wrong side of truth and goodness, it makes sense to seek a new normal, 
a new routine, right? I mean, it's easy to hear that person say, I don't want to go back to doing bad things. I don't want to go back to addiction. I don't want to go back to being in debt. I don't want to go back to angry outburst and having an ungrateful spirit. You know, I mean, I mean, that's the kind of natural tendency in a message like this. I don't want, I don't want to go back to what was bad, okay? And that's true enough, okay? We do want people to do that. We do want people to clean those kind of bad situations up. And for that, you need the Holy Spirit's power, okay? But here's, here's what I, I think many of us need to hear, okay, also, okay? Especially in this season of unique opportunity. And that is, is that maybe the message that a lot of us need to hear is not so much, don't blindly go back to the bad, but rather, don't go blindly back to the good. Why? Because if it's true that good is often the enemy of best, and it is, then I would say what sometimes keeps us from really experiencing what God wants for us, what keeps us from really experiencing God's best for us, is the good. It's the good. I mean, the focal point of this whole series of message, in my mind, is not so much that the bad, that bad is the enemy, although it is, okay? But rather, the focal point is that we see, that we see, those of us that gather in here each week, that we see for perhaps the very first time in our lives, that the good is the enemy of the best. And so we don't want to just go blindly back to what is good when God, through Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wants to lead us and guide us to something that's far better for us, okay? Are you hearing me, church family? Speak to me, yes? Okay, all right, so we're going to meet Elijah in the middle of his normal routine. And again, his normal routine isn't bad. In fact, it's what, church family? It's It's good, but God's going to disrupt his normal, uh, good, normal routine and give him a chance at something better, okay? So here's where we meet him. Verse 19, it says this. Elijah went from there and found Elijah, son of Saphat, and he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. So at God's leading, Elijah tracks down Elijah, and Elijah, he's a farmer, okay? And at first glance, I mean, Elijah's life, you can see, it's good, okay? I mean, he's already got a job, and he's pretty successful. I mean, he's, he's not just a farmer, but he's a, a wealthy farmer, okay? I mean, how do we know? Because uh, Elijah, he doesn't just have a six-row corn picker. No, no, he's got a 12-row corn picker, and he doesn't just have one 12-row corn picker, but listen, he's got 12 of them. Isn't that what your translation says? Sort of, yeah, okay. Not really, it doesn't say, it says oxen, right? Okay, but if it were in our culture today, that's what it would say, okay? Uh, But you see, Elijah, he's out plowing the fields with 12 yoke of oxen. And the average farmer in that day, we might call them middle-class farmers, average farmer, you know, he's got one. Okay, but Elijah, he's plowing with a yoke of oxen, a pair, okay? But he has 12 yoke, okay, which means he has 12 pair or 24 oxen. And that's all we know of, right? I mean, I because mean, you know farmers, how they like to collect old, uh, you know, old uh, oxen, okay? So he's probably got more in the barn, right? He's got more in the barn, okay? Now, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point that Elijah's wealthy, but 12 pair of oxen means at least 12 farmhands to run those oxen, and then you probably need a bookkeeper to do the payroll, and so you kind of get the point. Elijah's life, by most people's standards, I mean, you tell me, church family, from what we've read thus far, is Elijah's life bad or is it good? Speak to me. Is it what? It's good. Yeah, it's extremely good, okay? And to have a good life like that generally means, I mean, his normal life routine would be something like, He's working. He's working. I mean, he's a disciplined and driven leader, so he's worked hard, and he's made a lot of money. And there are probably a few other things that we could probably assume about his routine. I think, I think it's safe to assume that he didn't choose this life, but rather it was kind of handed down to him. And this might sound familiar to a lot of you, for his business would have been a family business, okay? I mean, his profession would have been a family profession. Even the work ethic was most likely something taught and passed down. Now, if you grew up on a farm, then you kind of know some of the pressure that goes along with all that, for there's a farm routine. In the spring, there's a routine to planting season, and in the fall, there's a harvest routine, and no one takes vacation in the spring or the fall, right? Because there's a lot to do. In fact, there aren't many uh, vacations, period on a farm, because there's always something to do on a farm, right? So here's what I would say, and this is more true than many of us realize, okay, but the focus of his life, Elijah's life, much of it was determined by the family that he was born into, 
right? I mean, like the trajectory of his life, he probably didn't necessarily choose it, but more so it was chosen for him for his life trajectory was determined by the traditions of his family for they were simply passed down. And listen, I recognize free will here, okay? You're like, what about free will, Mark? No, I recognize free will, but I think that's what a lot of us do, okay? Like we just do what we saw done. We just do what we saw done. And I'm not saying that's bad. In fact, like Elijah, it can be very good, okay? But the point is, for a lot of us, we were, we were just born into a rut. We were born into a rut, okay? Now, we never really chose it. We never really chose the routine. But when you think about the routine, it can be so much more than a profession, right? Like, like the way we parent our children, the interest that we have, okay? All of it, routine, okay? And much of it, we never really thought that much about it. We just kind of did what was expected of us, and we just went with that routine, and maybe that's where you find yourself today, okay? And you, ju you just didn't really think about some things until all of this hit, okay? And then you started thinking about life, okay? And instead, you were just, before that, you were just kind of living out the routine that motivated your parents, you know, or was motivated by your parents' expectations, or, or it was motivated by your cultural expectations, okay? I mean, culture can shape you, right? Like, like you were told a certain routine would bring about the American dream for you, and so that's what you did. And everyone you knew kind of did the same thing. They all went to a school somewhere. They all got, kind of lived out that same same routine and then everyone you know kind of worked that you've got jobs where they work the same hours and they buy the same things and they watch the same games and they shop at the same stores and no one really just stops and thinks is this what is this really what i want to do with my life is this what i i'm going to give myself to is this what my legacy is going to be i mean even i don't know do we ask is this what i want to pass down to my children this routine all because it just was kind of handed to me and i think that was true for elijah and for elijah his life was good, but still, I think on Elijah's average day, being a farmer, Elijah's day probably started like at daybreak, okay, probably before, but at least at daybreak when he'd meet his farmhands and, and like he did the day before, okay, and he'd give everybody their assignments and then he'd let them know which fields they were going to be in and then he would take one team of oxen and he would stare at the backside of those oxen like gripping that plow all day long. He worked the field, you know, and then he'd go home and he'd eat and he'd go to bed and he'd get up and do it all over again because that's the routine, right? And, and while like most farmers, Elijah probably, I think he probably loved what he did, okay? I mean, most farmers do. They just love what they do, you know, but, but I got to think at some point he did think to himself, is this it? I mean, is this really all that there is? I mean, God, really? I mean, is this all there is? Is this what, what you want me to do with my life? I mean, I think he probably thought that, okay? I mean, I can't speak for women in the room, but I kind of know men do this at some point, right? I know men do, okay? At a certain point in life, it's kind of a routine, okay? It's routine for men. At a certain point of life, many, many men ask themselves this question. Elijah must have. Perhaps he even prayed about it. I think he probably did. Seriously, I think a unique opportunity or season of life came along and Elijah realized that he was in a routine and even though it was a good routine, but, but he, said, he said to himself, is this all there is? And so he, I think he courageously prayed about it, in fact. I, and the reason I think he did is because if you know about God, he never calls you to something he hasn't prepared you for. So I think Elijah prayed because God knew Elijah was ready for this assignment. He knew he was ready, okay? But here's what I'm wondering. In this season of opportunity, I'm wondering if you've taken some time to do that in this, your unique season of opportunity. Have you? Have you taken some time where you've just stopped and you've just reflected and you've asked yourself, is this all I want my life to be? Is this all? This same routine over and over again? If not now, when? And so when we meet Elijah, you know, for him, it's just another day in his routine, meaning when he woke up, it appeared to be a day like any other day, okay? And then Elijah shows up, okay, which really it's God showing up behind the scenes. But yeah, Elijah shows up and he sees Elijah plowing, plowing the field with his 12th team of oxen. And here's what we read in verse 19b. It says, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. And I know that seems a little bit strange to us. I mean, it's not something in our culture, but he, Elijah, who's kind of a legend in his day, meaning people knew who he was and what he did. Okay, they knew who he was and what he did. I mean, it'd be like if you bump into Peyton Manning on the street and he's got a football in his hand and he just goes like this. You know what that means, right? It means go deep, 
right? It goes, and, and so that's what you do, right? Because you know. So Elijah walks over to Elijah, takes off his prophet's cloak, and he puts it on Elijah's shoulders, and then he just walks away. So what's happening there? Well, you, I mean, you might wonder, well, there, this was a way for Elijah to offer Elijah an invitation to something different, a new normal, if you will. This is a way to pass the mantle. This is a way to offer him a new job. It's a way to invite him into a calling to be his successor. And so Elijah is invited into a much different life. And it's not that his life as a farmer was bad. It's not that his life was broken or fractured because it wasn't. In fact, his life was what, church family? Elijah's life was what? It was good. It was very good. But God had something better for him. And so Elijah put out the, put, put the cloak over Elijah and he walks away. And here's what we read. Verse 28. It says, Elijah, when this happened, he, Elijah, left the ox standing there. Well, let's read it. It says 28. It says, Elijah then left his oxen and he ran after Elijah. Now, there are two things to note here. And of course, the first is he left what he was doing, his old normal, okay? He left his old normal and he ran towards Elijah, which means he's running towards a new normal, okay? So, so note what he did do, what he did do, okay? Which is he ran towards Elijah and this opportunity for a new normal. Second thing to note is what Elijah didn't do, okay? Note he doesn't say, hey, I've got this routine that I'm in, and I've got these plans that I've made, so let me finish working this field and let me wrap up my plans. And I mean, no, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, let me finish this routine and then, okay, you know, in a couple of months, why don't you just swing back around and then we can have a talk about it, okay? No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't do that. No, he leaves the oxen standing there and he runs after what God had for him, okay? He, he runs, so write this down because this is what happened. Elijah left his known routine for the unknown things of God. He left what he knew for something he didn't know, okay? And I want you to note this because, because if you just read Scripture, there are these moments in people's lives, people, people who go on to new adventures with God, that these moments are like spiritual markers, okay? And for whatever reason, this seems to be something that really matters to God, okay? And while God is incredibly patient, in other words, he, he'll meet you where you're at. He won't rush you. But when the moment comes, okay, it's not only about obedience, but it's about immediacy in your obedience, okay? I mean, like, we don't put it off. We don't procrastinate. And if you're like me, you know, a person who loves the routine, okay i mean you could think of all types types of reasons why why you got to finish your routine i mean but but when they come i mean these are defining moments okay and when they come that is the time to stop and ask what do i need to leave and what do i need to run towards okay so what's a defining moment look like mark well there are a multitude of ways that they might look like but a, a very common one is this, okay? It's very simple, but, but it's the real deal. I mean, I hear this fairly often. It's why I want to use it. You've probably experienced this. Someone comes up to me after a service and they say something like this. Wow, preacher, it felt like you were talking straight to me this morning. And you know what I tell them? I tell them the truth. I tell them, hmm, that wasn't me talking to you this morning. If you're feeling like that, that wasn't me. That was the Lord. That was the Holy Spirit. And if I were you, I'd listen to what he had to say, right? Now, I don't say this part, but I want to. So I'm going to now, okay? What I'd like to say is I'd listen to what he had to say now. I do it now, okay? Right? Because I know what's going to happen if you don't do it now, right? So defining moments are like that. Now, there, there may be a lot of things that lead up to that moment, okay? You know, that it's God preparing you and working on your heart. A lot of things leading up. But when it happens, it needs to happen now. Because big or small, it's a defining moment in your life, okay? Defining moments are like that. Now, there may be a lot of things, that, but it's time to go. It's time to go. Now, in Luke 18, much like Elijah to Elijah, a, a defining moment like that, we read about a man in the Bible described as the rich young ruler. He's also a wealthy man, probably powerful, and Jesus offers an opportunity to this rich young ruler to be, and you can kind of tell his heart's been moved before, but Jesus makes an invitation to be one of his disciples, extends the invitation to the rich young ruler to follow him, okay? And Jesus says to him, and you can find this in Luke 18, but Jesus says, Go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And make no mistake, it's a defining moment in this young man's life, okay? And we're told in Luke 18, 23, that the man walked away sad. 
And it's an interesting verse to me because I think it says something, okay? Because here's what it says. I mean, the text actually says, it says, he walked away sad because he had great wealth. Now, I find that very interesting because that's a very odd reason for anyone to walk away sad, don't you think? I'm so sad because I've got money, because I'm wealthy, right? He was sad because of his wealth. So sad, I take it, because he knew that wealth for him was too much to walk away from. He was sad because he wanted both. He wanted both. You see, he wanted, he wanted to do the new God thing, but he also wanted to keep the old wealth thing going. And I think, I think that's what a lot of us are going to attempt to do coming out of this difficult season of life. We're going to say, I know there are some things that need to change. I mean, I, I think we even might say, like, if you took notes last week and wrote some things, here are some things. You've already got them. Here are some things I know that need to be different. I know this, okay? So, yeah, God, I want the new God thing, but I'm going to keep the same old thing here, too. And if you want God to do a new thing while you're keeping, keep doing the old thing, it's not going to work. Not for very long. How do I know? Because that's not the deal that Jesus offers, right? Listen to Jesus in Luke chapter 9. He says, if you want to follow me, then you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. In other words, you can't become who you are meant to be and still be who you used to be at the same time. Can't do it. No, you, you've got to leave. You've got to run towards God. In other words, if you want to be who you were meant to be, you can't go on being who you used to be, Right? And if you want to do something different, then you can't keep doing what you did before. Something has to change. Listen, friends, the call to the, to the Christ follower has always been the same, and that is to take up your cross, and it's a call where the Lord calls us to something different, okay? And we want to say, yes, I know we do. In our hearts, we all do. But still, far too often, what we want is what we've had, okay? And so we want... What we want is, is we want to say yes to Jesus while we, we say no to ourselves, okay? Yes to Jesus means no to ourselves. But as you think about what God has for you in the future, your new normal, you just cannot say yes to Jesus unless, at least in one way or another, you say no to yourself, okay? Because that's what Jesus meant when he said, if you want to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself. It's just part of it, Okay? And so Elijah runs after Elijah, and he runs toward the unknown thing of God. And Elijah says in verse 20, first let me go kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. And Elijah in verse 20b says something that really doesn't fit our culture, but here's what he says. He says, go back, what have I done to you? Now, in other words, what he's saying is, that's fine, go ahead, go back, but think about what I've done for you okay, what I've done to you, okay? In other words, don't forget about this defining moment. Don't forget about the moment that I, I took off my cloak and I put it on your shoulders. Don't forget about your commitment. Don't go back and don't forget about what you've committed to here because I think Elijah knows that it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be an easy conversation for Elijah with his folks, okay? So he says, don't forget about the conviction that you're feeling right now. And so if you're feeling that kind of thing in this series where you know, you know, you might want to write this down. Don't forget about the conviction that you're feeling right now, okay? Put that in your notes. Don't forget about the conviction that you're feeling right now. I mean, that's what happens to most of us, right? I mean, you commit. You're, I mean, you're in church, and all of a sudden, the Spirit prompts you, and you go, you know, I, I thought of a friend. I need to send them a card. The Spirit's prompted me for sure, but by the time you get home, you forgot all about it, Right? Or you take a course in the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace class. You commit to a budget that will set you free, but not long after you find you've gone back to the old way of doing things. Or you go to a Christ in Youth Conference and you make a, a commitment of some sort, and then you go home and tell mom and dad not long after the commitment. It's lost. Listen, friends, Elijah is going to go home and he's going to tell his mom and dad about this new direction in his life. I just don't think it's probably going to go very well. You know, it's going to be a difficult conversation, right? I mean, mom and dad, I know you've worked hard and you've worked to build up this farm, you know, and it's all for me. I know, I know. And it's not that I'm thankful and it's not that I'm not appreciative, but well, I've decided to take a different direction, okay? Listen, Elijah knows that, that that's probably what's going to happen here. He'll need to go back home, and he'll have to explain himself. So Elijah says to Elijah, look, that's fine. You go back, say goodbye, but don't forget about this defining moment. 
Like, this is a defining moment. Don't forget about the moment of your conviction. Don't forget about this moment when your eyes were opened up. Don't forget about this moment when you determine you're not going to just keep doing what you've always done. Because, listen, friends, even though, even though you, you right now, you, 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 you think you won't forget about it, if you procrastinate even a week, you might find that it's pretty easy to just go back to the way things were before. And you'll be what you were before. And so Elijah goes back home, and I want you to see what he did, okay? Because he did what, church family? Verse 21, check it out. It says, so Elijah left him, and he went back, and he took his yoke of oxen, and he slaughtered them. <laughs> okay, that's pretty big, okay? Not only that, but he took the plow, and he used the wood, and he built a fire to roast the meat, and then he passed around the meat to all the townspeople so that they could eat. Okay, I mean, it kind of reminds me of that field of dreams, you know, where the guy cut down his corn to build a ball field. Everybody in town's like, oh, that dude's crazy. You know, and I imagine some people are saying that about Elijah here, right? I mean, they're saying, I don't see it, right? I know, I know they are, okay? I want you to see something, church family. And the something I want you to see is, is that this is so much more than Elijah burning a plow. It's Elijah burning any possibility of having a blind default moment ever again. I mean, you talk about public defining moments. What he's doing here, he's eliminating any chance of ever going back to his old normal. So, you know, let me, let me refer back to a story I told you earlier about when someone comes up and they say, hey, preacher, uh, I thought you were speaking straight to me this morning. It was like you were talking right into me this morning. And we all know, uh, well, I'm going to ask you, do we all know that that's not me, that that's God, that's the Holy Spirit? Do we know that, church family? Speak to me. Yeah, we've all experienced that, right? Yeah. So listen, friends, when that happens and the Holy Spirit prompts you, I just want to say to you, don't just go back to what's familiar. Don't just go back to what's comfortable. Don't go back to what's practical. Don't just stay in the routine because that's the routine. Instead, realize something supernatural just happened, okay? And for some of you this morning, it could be happening right now. I mean, do you sense it? That Jesus is calling you to something more something deeper. I mean, if you do, then understand he's not calling you to just be interested. He's calling you to be invested, okay? I mean, it's good to listen. It's good to come and listen so that you might know the truth, but he's calling you to go tell the truth to others. That's the call, okay? And it's definitely good that he's calling you to attend, but please listen closely because he's calling you to so much more than that because he's calling you to serve. Okay, so if you sense the spirit working within you, make no mistake, this is that moment for many of you. And it needs to be this moment for many right now, okay? Because if it's not now in this time of season of unique opportunity, well, if it's not now, I don't know when it will be. I mean, it might require something much more personally overwhelming to get your attention. I don't know. I hope not. But why not let this be your spiritual marker? That the moment that defines your new normal, like now. So, what we read here is what Elijah, he, he burns his plow, and Elijah is eliminating the option of changing his mind. And so the question we need to be asking is this, what are some of the plows that we need to burn? I mean, what are some plows that you need to burn? I mean, publicly burn. Okay, so that people know that you're not just going to go back to being the way you always were before. Okay, so what is it? What is it? What are some plows that you need to burn? Now, here's the thing, and the truth is, I think we all need to do this to some degree, okay? But I, I, I don't want you to go home, and while you're at home, I don't want you to burn anything, okay? I don't want you to set any fires, okay? And uh, I mean, I mean uh, we want to be clear on this. I'm not directing anyone or guiding anyone to go home and actually burn something, okay? Uh, but I like the idea of doing it visually, okay? Like, you know, a visual reminder of a decision that you're making here today, like a declaration onto the Lord, okay? That you're making a commitment to not going back to the way things were before this all started, you know, to your old routine, to your old normal. But you will live always, always seeking the change that the Lord leads you into. And when the wind blows and you sense the word or you sense the spirit speaking to you, like when you're prompted, you understand he's leading you. And so what you need is a visual reminder that you'll be faithful to running towards that, okay? I mean, put something up on your fridge, like a sticky note that says, burn the plow, you know, uh, or, or maybe the phrase, seeking daily, my new normal. I don't care what it is. I mean, I don't care what it is, but go home and put up a visual reminder of your commitment that you're making today, 
to follow Christ, even if it means leaving the good behind, that you might discover the best. So, do something to serve as a reminder, because the reality is as strongly as you might feel the wind blowing in this moment, if you don't run towards him now, chances are six days, six weeks, six months from now, you might find yourself kind of drifting towards a blind, a blind default, and, and, and you just re- return to your old routine. I mean, you could, you could start right now, okay? This could be your day, okay? Write it down in your notes. What do, I, what, what do you need to leave? What plows do you need to burn? What's the Spirit calling me to? What do I need to leave behind that I might discover God's unknown new normal for me, okay? So take a minute and write it out before you leave this morning. Set it up as a reminder at home, okay? Let today be a defining moment for you, Okay? And you know, when I got to this part of my sermon, I thought, that's page 22, that's enough. And, uh, and I'm tempted to quit right there, but I wanted to end this series the way we began. So, uh, and, and we find that theme in the story. We talked about humility the first two weeks of this series, and it ends that way in 1 Kings 19, 21b, where it says this. Then, meaning Elijah, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his, what church family? His servant. Yeah. You know why I love that part? Because it says he ran towards humble service, okay? Because it reminds me of the upside-down world that Jesus talked about all the time. Here's what I mean by that. To the world, to the world, it seems like Elijah gave up the best to become something much less, doesn't it? I mean, he was the boss. He was the master. He's the big man in charge, but now, for the ne- and for the next 18 years, okay, he's going to be another man's servant, okay, another man's assistant, associate, whatever. But in the upside-down world of Jesus, the greatest among us are those who humble themselves and serve. And so I guess what I love about whatever it is that we as a church are going to do, you know, run towards, okay, it needs to include humility and service. Humility and service. Okay, and I don't know exactly how to apply this to your specific situations, but this I do know. I know that what he wants to call you to always, 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 okay, whatever your situation is, is greater humility and greater service. And Jesus said, I mean, Jesus said it, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. I mean, that was his mission. That was his purpose. And so when we follow him the way Elijah followed Elijah, when we follow Jesus, then that's what we do. That's what we do too, right? We deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow him with humility and service. And all God's people said, let's pray it would be so. Father, we come this morning and uh, we're reminded once again and uh, just of some of the basic things about that you're always on the move and you're always doing something and it requires sacrifice on our end. We deny and we sacrifice and we follow because that's what our master does. So Lord, we pray this morning that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, because there's probably some things that we need to change about our old normal, that we might receive what's best, that we might be what's best, that we might be a blessing unto others. We pray it would be so, Lord. We pray we just, your spirit would work on us, Lord, that we would see it, we'd put it up, you know, on our fridges or whatever, Lord, that we'd be constantly reminded that we're seeking this new normal, the unknown things of God, but we understand that we have to give up some of the known things of our routine. And so we pray it would be so, that Jesus would receive the the glory, that his kingdom would be advanced, and that, uh, uh, that we would be faithful. We pray it would be so, in Christ's name, amen.